Good morning. My name is Ryan Roberts. I'm an oncologist caring for children with cancer and a scientist studying the biology of sarcomas at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. I'm also a board member of the Canines and Kids Foundation, which is the organizer of this meeting. We'd like to welcome you to the 2020 Pause for a Cure Symposium. This is the third iteration of this meeting, which is designed to foster collaboration across industry, academia, advocacy communities, and regulatory communities to share the most current science illustrating how alike cancers shared by kids and dogs can be. The fact is that kid tumors are more like dog tumors than they are like adult tumors. And we hope to show how integrated approaches can lead to true win-win outcomes, helping to crush cancer at both ends of the leash, a phrase that happens to also be our foundation's tagline. We invite you to learn more about Canines and Kids' mission by visiting our virtual booth in the exhibit hall, where, by the way, you can also get your own crush cancer face mask if you're interested. We want to thank the partners and sponsors that have made this event possible in a year of pandemonium and encourage you to also visit their virtual booths in the exhibit hall. These include Merck, who is our co-presenter for the second year in a row, the Petco Foundation in collaboration with Blue Buffalo Foundation, who are our title sponsors. Sanofi, our keynote sponsor. The Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy. Rally Foundation for Childhood Cancer Research. Elias Animal Health and Morris Animal Foundation. We point out that there are several features of this virtual meeting that you can use to take advantage of opportunities to network and to talk with other participants. These include the networking lounge, which will be available between meetings and even during meetings, where you can meet with speakers and other participants. The chat function, where you can talk to individuals directly, and the poster session, where you'll see several presentations and videos from fantastic submitted abstracts. When you log into each presentation or panel, you'll have an opportunity to submit questions via the Ask Question box. The speakers and moderators will receive these questions in the background and be able to organize them to address questions within the Q&A portion of each presentation. Any questions submitted and not addressed within the session will be followed up with an email following the event. The presentations for the day will be listed in chronological order within the auditorium, and there will be a 15-minute countdown before they start so that people can log in and view the presentation content before the broadcast begins. Presentations will remain available to all participants for on-demand viewing for 12 months following this live event. To start this meeting off, we'll be privileged to hear a keynote address highlighting the historical development of this field from the unique perspective of Dr. Peter Adamson. Dr. Adamson has made a career out of advocating for innovation and systematic improvement in the care of children with childhood cancer. First, as a translational scientist at CHOP, and then serving as chair of the Children's Oncology Group. He was appointed by President Obama to serve on the National Cancer Advisory Board and was a member of the Blue Ribbon Panel for Vice President Biden's Cancer Moonshot Initiative. Since completing his term as president of COG, he has transitioned into a role as a leader within industry, currently serving as the Global Head of Oncology Development and, and of Pediatric Innovation at Sanofi. I have long respected Peter for his vision and his ability to see how academic and industry efforts can align toward common goal to, as we would say, crush cancer. He's been a longstanding advocate for integrated drug development using approaches that benefit both veterinary and human medical communities. I can't think of a better individual to start us off today to give his perspective to that theme. Please join me in welcoming Peter Adamson. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank the organizers of what I'm sure will be 
a very important and interesting symposium for inviting me. So let me share my screen and get started with today's talk. So today I'm gonna to give you an overview of new drug development and take a historical perspective. I'm gonna talk about where we started, where we got stuck and where we're going. As far as disclosures, I now am an employee of Sanofi based in Cambridge, Mass, but I will not be discussing any of Sanofi's products. I do wanna give a special thank you to my colleagues, Richard Gorlick, Katie Janeway and Doug Hawkins for sharing their knowledge, their perspectives, and importantly, many of their PowerPoint files. I do wanna emphasize, however, that all errors in this talk are, are mine alone. New drug development, I'm gonna talk briefly about novel cytotoxics and then talk a little bit in more detail about targeted therapy. And I've broken targeted therapy down into two broad buckets. One, molecular oncology, focusing primarily on small molecules, and then more broadly on immuno-oncology. So let me start with novel cytotoxics. And for that, I'm gonna give a very brief history of methotrexate, adriamycin, and platinum, MAP chemotherapy. Chemotherapy and surgery continue to be the cornerstone of treatment for children, adolescents, and adults with osteosarcoma. And understanding how we arrived at MAP chemotherapy, I think begins to help understand some of the challenges we have. <clears throat> so we have to go back to 1967 and Isaac Jurassi, who was at my former institution, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, began treating children with acute lymphoblastic leukemia with high-dose methotrexate. And shown on the right here are some of the doses he used. They range from 500 milligram uh, per meter squared up to 1500 milligram per meter squared. But to put it in perspective, and again, this is 1967, standard dose of methotrexate back then was 2.5 or five milligrams. So going to doses of a gram with Leucovorin Rescue was quite a leap and really was based on a good deal of preclinical <clears throat> preclinical research, as well as understanding the pharmacology of methotrexate. Forward to Norm Jaffe, looking at the data, and then in 1972, reporting on 10 patients he treated with high-dose methotrexate and osteosarcoma, and reported both partial responses and complete responses to high-dose methotrexate with Leucovorin Rescue. And that really set the stage for multi-drug chemotherapy. And by the 1980s, multi-drug chemotherapy was be beginning to establish itself in the treatment of patients with osteosarcoma, but it became controversial. And the controversy was not everyone was convinced that chemotherapy was responsible for the observed improvements in outcome. And thus, Michael Link, working with investigators, uh, including Teresa Vietti, the uh, former chair of uh, the original Pediatric Oncology Group, or POG, set out to do a randomized trial. And that randomized trial was going to ask, is chemotherapy truly important for taking care of patients with osteosarcoma? And the results were rather conclusive. Now, shown on the right, are the survival curves, with the upper curves being patients who were treated with adjuvant chemotherapy. And there were two groups of patients because it was becoming clear in, many, in the eyes of many investigators that chemotherapy was important and not everyone was willing to be randomized. So the study looked at both randomized patients, and those are the curves with fewer patients, as well as those patients that selected to be uh, on chemotherapy, and those are the curves with more patients. Nonetheless, it clearly demonstrated a significant advantage to adjuvant chemotherapy. And by 1986 established that adjuvant chemotherapy was an important component of treatment for patients mm -hmm. with osteosarcoma. Well, this curve is also important because it really shows what our challenge has been. So if one looks at this curve from a paper in 1986 from Michael Link and compares it to a curve from data 30 years later, you can see we haven't made progress. These curves are virtually overlappable. We are stuck at about 70% of ventry survival for patients with localized osteosarcoma. So let's take a step back and talk about how we have made progress in the treatment of childhood cancer 
and really the, it's been the application of some generalizable treatment principles that have driven this. So I wanna share with you what I think are the four fundamental principles that have helped improve the outcome for children with cancer. The first is combination regimens. That is a concurrent administration of multiple non-cross resistant anti-cancer drugs. That became the cornerstone, combination chemotherapy of cancer treatment, not only in children, but cancer treatment in adults with cancer. Dose intensity, administer the highest tolerable dose at the shortest tolerable interval. Now this was most recently realized in a study in patients with Ewing sarcoma with interval compressed chemotherapy, another, another approach to dose intensive chemotherapy. Adjuvant setting, administration of drug when disease burden is minimal and risk adapted treatment by uh, using biologic and other risk factors. And perhaps most importantly, the response to initial therapy guiding further therapy. These treatment principles have driven the improvement in outcome for children with cancer. And this is probably best visualized when one looks at the history of children with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So shown here is data from the Children's Cancer Group, Children's Oncology Group from the late 60s to most recently up to 2009. And beyond the quantum leap that occurred in the early 1970s with the advent of preventive CNS therapy for all children with ALL, every generation of trials has improved the outcome and it's improved the outcome in large measure by applying these principles. However, the story for osteosarcoma is quite different. Even though these principles were, have been applied over the years, progress hasn't been realized. So when, look, when one looks at the US really since uh, the 1980s, there has been no progress, be it in children less than 15 years old or 15 to 19 years of age, we've seen no progress. This is not just a US phenomenon. Looking at the curve on the right from Mike Isakoff's paper, Again, whichever cooperative group has looked, we always end up at the same place. We have not made advances by applying these principles. This was, I think, most clearly demonstrated in the largest trial in patients with osteosarcoma, and that was Uramus-1, uh, a collaborative study between uh, Europe and America that looked at whether whether in addition to MAP chemotherapy, the addition of ifosfamide and etoposide in a subset of patients could improve the outcome. So it was a large randomized trial and they applied these principles. The first principle was adapting therapy based on initial response. So for patients who were poor responders to initial two cycles of chemotherapy, they were randomized to receive either continued MAP chemotherapy or MAP chemotherapy with the addition of cycles of IE, BP69 phosphamide, or IA, ifosfamide and adriamycin. Now recognize that BP16 and ifosfamide both had single agent activity and as a combination had upwards response rates of 40 to almost 50% in relapsed and refractory patients. So there was likely not a more effective regimen that was potentially non-cross resistant to MAP and that's what went forward. Unfortunately, you're all familiar with the, with the results, overlapping curves. This did not improve the outcome. It checked every box, combination regimens, dose intensity, adjuvant treatment, risk adapted therapy. But unfortunately, Uramus-1 is not an outlier. Even as we try to identify novel agents in the relapse and refractory setting, the vast majority of our cytotoxic studies have not shown positive results. One can go from drugs like topotecan and oxaliplatin all the way up to most recently, aribulin. We are not seeing signals of efficacy. So fast forward, I think we've all come to the conclusion that for novel cytotoxics, no meaningful likelihood of improving the outcome will emerge and would have to be under rather exceptional circumstances that we would continue to develop new studies for such agents. So let's turn to targeted therapy. And I'm gonna begin with molecular oncology. Well, step one in any targeted therapy, including an osteosarcoma, is identify the target. Now for most childhood cancers, we have a different kind of problem. If one looks at the mutational landscape of cancer, and shown here are the somatic mutation frequencies by the different types of cancers, 
on the left side of this curve with very low mutation frequencies are many childhood cancers. On the right side of the curve, you have tumors like melanoma, lung, uh, lung squamous cell carcinoma, orders of magnitude higher. The outlier for us in pediatric oncology is osteosarcoma. So if one looks at the cir a circus plot of a patient with osteosarcoma, the genome is remarkably disrupted. No other pediatric cancer has a genome as disrupted as osteosarcoma. What's driving this? Well, we learned about 10 years ago of something that's now called chromothripsis. This was a paper by Stevens and colleagues, massive genomic rearrangement acquired in a single catastrophic event during cancer development. So they uncovered this where there, where there are tens to hundreds of genomic rearrangements that occur in a one-off cellular crisis. And when one looks across the spectrum of cancers, looking at the percentage of samples with chromothripsis at the highest end, where the red arrow, the second highest is osteosarcoma. So this leads the way in disrupted genomes. What does that mean for identifying targets? Well, I think the simplest way of putting it is it means it's complicated. And the reason it's complicated is because there are so many different variations. However, progress is being made. So this is work that was driven in large measure by a parent advocate, uh, Teresa Beach, working with a number of investigators in uh, foundation medicine, and basically started to find small subsets of recurrent potential targets. And this has helped setting the stage now for clinical trials. And one of the largest clinical trials uh, taking place to look for signals of targeted agents is the NCI Children's Oncology Group Pediatric Match Studies, where specific genomic testing is done looking for a portfolio of different potential targets. If the target is found, a drug can be administered in a phase two setting. So shown here in a study that's led by Will Parson and Nito Seibels are the 10 current arms that are enrolling and patients with osteosarcoma are also participating in this study. This is not the only study that's occurring with targeted therapy. We're seeing an increasing number of targeted agents being interrogated to see if there's a signal. But perhaps one of the strongest signals that has emerged in these patients has been with multi-targeted kinase inhibitors. So in this case, these are agents that don't just hit one kinase, but actually hit a number of different kinases. And that's in fact what might be needed in a disease as heterogeneous as osteosarcoma. But we are seeing repetitive uh, uh, reports of reasonable partial response rates, and perhaps even more importantly, four-month progression-free survival rates that are telling us there's a signal here that should be interrogated. So currently, the Children's Oncology Group is developing a study to look at MAP chemotherapy in combination with cabozantinib, one of the multi-targeted TKIs, to see if in fact, one, it can be successfully combined, and two, can we begin to see evidence of an improvement in outcome? So where I would say we are um, in molecular oncology is newer methodologies, newer genomic testing is beginning to be applied, and a number of leads are being identified and being pursued in the clinic. So let me now turn to immuno-oncology. And you would think by my listing it here as the last topic, it's the newest field of drug development. And in some respects that, that's true. In osteosarcoma, that actually is not true. So bear with me as I once again take you on a, on a very brief history of immunotherapy for osteosarcoma. It begins with a surgeon pictured here. This is uh, William Coley, William B. Coley, who was at the time called a bone surgeon, that would be called an orthopedic surgeon. And in 1893, he published this paper in the American Journal of Medical Sciences, entitled the treatment of malignant neoplasms by repeated inoculations of a bacterial infection. And he reported 10 cases. 
he referenced an early paper, and I think it's interesting to read the case report from the publication he made in 1891, so now 130 years ago. The treatment has become known as Coley's toxin. Here's one of the cases. In the cases which I've collected, there's one which bears upon this question. The patient, a male, 35 years, was operated on by Dr. Bull in 1888 for a large periosteal round cell sarcoma of the lower third of the femur with secondary deposits in the center of the bone. Amputation of mid-thigh and upper thirds was performed. Second week after operation, the patient had a very severe tech attack of pyemia, multiple abscesses in various parts of the body, fever, 104 to 105. Last paragraph, the patient has had no recurrence and is now living nearly three years after the operation. But Dr. Coley appropriately appeared cautious even back in the 1890s. Of course, this is not to be regarded as absolute evidence that the attack of pyemia had any influence in preventing a recurrence but when we consider the highly malignant nature of the tumor, and remember how few do not recur, there still remains a reasonable degree of probability that such influence existed. And he pursued the idea of generating a robust immune response through infection with high fevers by actually infecting patients with toxins that he knew would drive fever to treat patients with cancer, including predominantly patients with sarcoma. Now, this was met with a fair amount of skepticism over the years, but largely was then put on the back burner completely with the advent of radiotherapy and ultimately nitrogen mustard and other chemotherapeutic agents. And that's where uh, immunotherapy remained up until, again, probably the 1960s when it comes to osteosarcoma. So this was a report of a vaccine trial by Ralph Markov and colleagues, began in 1963, and they made a lyophilized homogenous vaccine from the primary tumor tissue and was given to a child with osteosarcoma and pulmonary mets, and ultimately reported on that series. And the analysis they did suggested that there may be some benefit. Again, an uncontrolled single arm study, um, but the idea of vaccinating against the tumor developing immune response was being pursued pretty actively in the 1960s. Now, what I would say a, a rather more dramatic approach to this uh, was predominantly late 60s, 1970s, adoptive immunotherapy, a term that really we would not see again probably for another decade in the in treatment of primary osteosarcoma. And I've highlighted it on the left. Fresh aliquots of osteosarcoma obtained at the time of surgical ablation were transplanted to a human recipient. Now, let me pause there. They don't detail exactly who this recipient was, but it was allogeneic. And actually, you can dig back in the literature, and they, it appears, were predominantly transplanting the tissue into another patient with disseminated osteosarcoma. I think um, in the current era, many IRBs would probably collapse when they uh, heard this, but this was done back in the late 60s and 70s. They would transplant tissue to a recipient. Reading on, after periods ranging from 14 to 21 days, the implants were excised and presumptively sarcoma sensitized, peripheral blood mononuclear cells were obtained from the recipient by leukophoresis. These allogeneic cells were immediately infused into the implant donor. Adoptive immunotherapy, late 60s, early 70s. They reported on, uh, I believe, a total of um, 32 patients. They could not find clear evidence of an anti-cancer effect in this series. Now, let's fast forward to some more recent uh, signals. Uh, for osteosarcoma and immunotherapy, and muramil tripeptide, MTPPE, meatpacked, had its own controversy. But again, I don't think any of us would argue that there was clear signal that the immune system could be engaged. More recently, 
work done by Nikki Mason at UPenn uh, with a HER2 targeting listeria, trying to induce HER2 specific immunity. This in a canine model, very intriguing data as well. So some clear signs that the immune system could potentially be engaged or can potentially be engaged to treat patients with osteosarcoma. Now, immunotherapy really took off in the last 15 years. And one of the major drivers of that was the development of checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, the paper, I think one of the most seminal papers was that um, from Jim Allison's lab back in 1995, where he described CTLA-4 and, and, and demonstrated that uh, inhibitory signals derived from CTLA-4 were an important way that cancers evaded the immune system. And he continued to build on this work. And ultimately, this hypothesis was tested in patients with melanoma with ipilimumab, a CTLA-4 antibody. And this paper published in August of 2010 in the New England Journal of Medicine clearly showed a significantly improved survival of patients treated with ipilimumab. They also uh, co-administered with GP100, which didn't seem to have an impact uh, beyond ipilimumab, improved the outcome for patients with melanoma. And this launched a, a, a real tidal wave of clinical trials using checkpoint inhibitors. Jim Allison and Tsuku Hanjo went on to receive the 28 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for their work in this field. And it truly has transformed not only how we think about cancer, but now today, how we treat cancer. So those of us in pediatric oncology, when these data emerged, most of us immediately started thinking about osteosarcoma because what soon followed was the, the, the uh, idea that it was a high burden of antigens and perhaps more importantly, neoantigens that would drive the response to checkpoint inhibitors. And where would you look for the most neoantigens? Well, you would look in a tumor that had a highly disrupted genome and thus we thought osteosarcoma. If any tumor in pediatrics is gonna be responsive, it ought to be osteosarcoma. Well, unfortunately, like before, it's complicated. So pembrolizumab, a PD-1 inhibitor, shown on the left is a waterfall plot. And as you can see in this study, in the purple bars, 19 uh, patients with osteosarcoma, only one patient with a response. Very, very limited activity, pembrolizumab. But it, it hasn't been only pembrolizumab a number of uh, PD-1 uh, inhibitors and PD-L1 inhibitors have been studied. On the right, a swimmer's plot for nivolumab. And if you look at the second from bottom, the swimmer's plot in yellow, these are the patients with osteosarcoma, 13 patients. You can see very quickly, they stayed on therapy for a maximum of two cycles and the majority came off before then. So highly disappointing that we could not leverage a major advance in cancer treatment for patients with osteosarcoma. But we, and many people who do research in this area, are learning more. And we're learning more understanding what is driving the lack of responsiveness and potentially how to overcome that lack of responsiveness. So this paper, uh, by Dr. Wu at uh, MD Anderson, Immunogenomic Landscape of Osteosarcoma, really uncovered some data and they drew, I'd say, five major conclusions from their work. Mutation burdens are not associated with immune infiltrate levels. So it's obviously the, the T cells within the tumor that are gonna drive that response, but they could not find that uh, correlation. Uh, surprisingly, a low level of predicted neoantigen expression. And if you look at the figure uh, on the right, looking at the number of non-synonymous mutations, you can see the expressed neoantigens level in red are a very small minority of what one would have hoped was being expressed. They also went on to postulate and show data suggesting low T cell receptor productivity clonality, insufficient immune infiltrate, and ultimately evidence for multiple immunomodulatory mechanisms. 
This work and work by many other investigators are now giving us new clues and thinking about new, new approaches to immuno-oncology for patients with osteosarcoma. And many of us really view this as an exciting time because uh, the armamentarium that we now have in immuno-oncology is continuing to grow and grow almost at a daily basis. It's not just monoclonal antibodies that are now available to us. An increasing number of antibody drug conjugates, antibodies against targets that may be quite relevant to subsets of patients with osteosarcoma are in the clinic. We see bispecific antibodies being developed for solid tumors, tri-specific antibodies being developed, really remarkable uh, chemistry that is undergoing to the development of very potent and very specific uh, antibodies that can engage the immune systems in ways that we really couldn't have imagined 10 years ago. Layer on that, the advances in cellular therapies, not only CAR T and building T cells, but now NK cells are coming onto the horizon. So an increasing spectrum of approaches that will hopefully begin to unravel the recalcitrant nature of osteosarcoma. So despite Dr. Coley, having introduced uh, immunotherapy more than 130 years ago, I think it's best to think about immuno-oncology as we really are just getting started. We're at the beginning of this process. It can't come too soon, but advances indeed will come. And I think in targeted therapy and specifically in immuno-oncology, we're going to see those advances come for subsets of patients with osteosarcoma over the next five years. So let me close uh, with another person that was highly important to uh, improving the treatment for children with cancer and specifically to increasing the cure rate for many, treatment, uh, many children with cancer, and that's Trudy Elian. And if you don't know, uh, Dr. Elian, uh, work that she began in the 1940s and continued through the 50s, 60s, and onward, her laboratory developed uh, six mercaptopurine, six thioguanine, uh, azathioprine, uh, acyclovir, uh, and even uh, AZT used for the treatment of, of HIV. Truly a, a remarkable scientist who was developing therapy that today we would call targeted therapy. Back then the term hadn't been invented, but she knew exactly what she wanted to go after in the cell and to, to develop molecules to go after that. And so she, when she gave the presidential address in uh, 1985 to ACR, and two years later, I think, uh, she and uh, George Hitchens won the uh, Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology. This is what she said in a talk that she entitled Selectivity, Key to Chemo Chemotherapy. For many years, chemotherapists have thought the touchstone, which would turn lead into gold, the magic bullet of Ehrlich, which would go directly to the target without harming normal, normal cells. And she went on to say, once you find the basic biochemical differences between the target and the host, then seek ways to utilize this information. Those principles most certainly continue to apply today. They apply for targeted therapies, be it molecular oncology or immuno-oncology. So with that, I'm gonna end my talk. Um, my dogs, Roscoe and Luna, have been waiting patiently for me to stop talking to the computer, and I thank you for your attention. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Joshua Schiffman, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about childhood cancer, dogs, and my life. When I was 15 years old, I was actually diagnosed with a childhood cancer called Hodgkin lymphoma. As you can imagine, and as would be the case in any young teenager, this changed my life trajectory completely. I said to myself, self, when I grow up, I wanna become a pediatric cancer doctor and take care of other kids with cancer, just the way the doctors had taken care of me. Well, life was good, life was hard, went to undergrad, medical school, residency, and began my fellowship. I finally had arrived. 
I was going to become a pediatric cancer doctor. Well, just about that same time, my wife and I decided we would get a dog. Actually, not these dogs behind me now, but a different dog, a Bernese Mountain Dog. And we loved our dog. This was BK, before kids. And we called our dog Rhodey. That was his name. We were both from Rhode Island originally. Well, Rhodey became a really big part of our family. We ended up having kids as well. And about six years into Rhodey's life, he began to limp. And that was a problem. It turns out Rhodey, as a Bernese mountain dog, was diagnosed with something called histiocytic sarcoma, a very, very aggressive kind of tumor that Bernese mountain dogs tend to be prone to. Well, it turns out along my own career, taking care of kids with cancer, I became very interested in hereditary cancer and the genetics of which kids get cancer and why, including myself when I was just 15 years old. And so unfortunately, we had to put Rhodey to sleep. And in the process, this opened my eyes to the world of dogs and cancer. And I met many, many wonderful colleagues and friends like Dr. Matthew Breen and Dr. Amy LeBlanc, among many, many others, who were able to teach me that it's not just kids that get cancer, like my own patients, but it's also dogs. Dogs get a tremendous amount of cancer. And as you all know, because you're sitting there today watching, dog cancer and childhood cancer is very, very similar. And in fact, after my own dog passed away from cancer, we began to focus in the lab and try to understand what are the genetics of dog tumors? Not only which kids would be getting cancer, but what dogs would be getting cancer and how do they overlap? And how could one teach the other? How do we learn from dogs to help kids with cancer? How do we learn from kids to help dogs with cancer? And so along this adventure of trying to study cancer in dogs, of course, we got our own new dogs, we began to really think about not only who's getting more cancer, like dogs and some of these patients, but even who's getting possibly less cancer. This led to many other adventures, including elephants and many other wild animal species. And eventually we even started a biotech company to make new drugs from nature and to take those drugs and to learn from those drugs about how to make new medicine, not just for kids with cancer, but for dogs with cancer. And so it's really come full circle for me now working with this new biotech company trying to make cancer drugs called Peel Therapeutics. Peel is the Hebrew word for elephant and trying to take our new medicines and see where do they fit taking care of dogs with cancer, and children with cancer. And so my career, really my whole life, has been focused on cancer and animals, and animals with cancer, and animals with more cancer, and animals with less cancer. And it all comes back to canines and kids, and pause for the cure. And it's really such an honor to be able to have shared my message with you today and to tell you a little bit about my own experiences and why it is just so important to study these animals, to love them, to cherish them, and to learn from them so that we can help other dogs with cancer in the future and we can help our patients, our children uh, who have cancer as well. And they really go hand in hand, both ends of the leash, and again, it's such a wonderful thing to know that so many people are interested in this area of research. And together with our dogs and our human patients, we're gonna make a difference in the fight against cancer. So enjoy the rest of the conference. And again, welcome and thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. Hi. Thank you all for allowing me to join you today and tell the story about participating in a clinical trial as a canine parent. I'm going to talk about our dog, why I decided to participate in the trial, and what our experience was like. So first of all, a little bit about Cash. 
Um, Cash was a retired racing greyhound. His racing name was CG's Mr. Cash. And he ran in 74 races, finishing in the top three in 50% of those. He was a healthy and strong dog when he was diagnosed with osteosarcoma. And as you can see from his photos, he was a goofball. The timeline for Cash's um, uh, story with osteosarcoma is that he started limping in early September of 2016. The preliminary diagnosis came back from an x-ray and we presented him as a candidate for the National Cancer Institute and Morris Animal Foundation COTC-22 clinical trial in late September. He was presented at the University of Missouri Columbia, which we affectionately call Mizzou here in Missouri. Uh, the diagnosis of osteosarcoma in the left distal radius was confirmed on that day and his leg was amputated the next day. Three days later, Cash came home for recovery and he was par uh, selected to participate in the standard of care arm of that clinical trial. So in in addition to the amputation, he received four doses of carboplatin chemotherapy and then had to go back every eight weeks for checkups. So the O word, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about osteosarcoma because I know you are familiar with it, but just like in humans in canines, it is just as bad. It's painful and aggressive. And even with amputation and chemotherapy, the average lifespan is only about 12 months. So why did we say yes? Well, first of all, we wanted to eliminate the pain. And originally we had said no, but the trick with saying no is trying to figure out when to say goodbye before the leg breaks. So by saying yes, we were able to remove the pain from cash. And then when we learned that childhood osteosarcoma is very similar to canine osteosarcoma and that this clinical trial would be looking for um, additional medicines to extend life, we felt like that was the bonus reason to get cash involved. My husband and I are both supporters of science and we had the capability and the flexibility to be able to participate in the trial. So what do I mean by the capability and flexibility? Well, the clinical trial experience um, can be burdensome. It was not burdensome for us because we had the flexibility to be able to participate. We had supportive employers. We were able to work from home. We were able to have a flexible schedule and we were able to do the travel. Um, so that's something that's very important to consider because there um, are specific protocols that must be followed. And if you then you risk putting the trial in jail. Um, our experience at Mizzou was wonderful. We had great patient and parent care there, and really everybody there became like friends to us. Um, the doctors we became very close to, and mostly we were in awe at just how much of a difference that our dog could make uh, to the science of curing this horrible cancer. So there, from in the end, um, it turns out that Cash was one of Mizzou's longest survivors. Um, he was in remission for nearly three years, and he touched many lives while he was alive. And I'd like to think that he's still touching people's lives today um, with the science that was uh, built uh, in that clinical trial. So as a canine mom who has lost a dog to cancer, and as a person who lives with a chronic form of cancer, I can really say this with all sincerity. Let's crush cancer at both ends of the leash. Thank you so much for giving me the time to speak today. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity to uh, talk about the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study. Uh, supported by Morris Animal Foundation and others. I'm Dr. Uh, Rod Page, and I'm joined today by Dr. Janet patterson Payne, who is the Chief Scientific Officer for the Morris Animal Foundation. Uh, she'll be, uh, I'll be passing off the conversation to her in uh, 10 or 15 slides. So we're really pleased to be able to provide this information, and thanks to the organizing committee for Pause for uh, Cure to allow us to, uh, to present this. We have a tremendous amount of really fascinating data to uh, go through. So I'm gonna move right on to um, some of the, uh, the next slides. So we started thinking about what 
could potentially be a game changer for cancer prevention and understanding a variety of other uh, outcomes from a large population, a, a lifetime cohort, essentially a cradle to grave uh, sort of a story from a group of dogs that would help us to understand the risk factors for uh, cancer. So we began uh, this about um, thinking about this almost uh, 10 or 12 years ago. And we uh, realized that we created something here that has a tremendous um, additional ancillary outcome uh, opportunity. So study outcomes are going to be focused, as you'll see in a moment, on some of the primary outcomes. But uh, in addition, we know that this is going to create a, a database so far, you know, 5 million data points on a population of dogs as they age and as they go through their lifestyle uh, to look at um, informing the health of dogs and other species, hopefully, including humans, about some of the um, uh, shared exposure um, types of issues, as well as um, helping to be more of a, a policy type uh, opportunity for looking at uh, global health care and companion animal. So um, I think you'll I think you'll really appreciate the progress that we've made in the last uh, 10 years in terms of a variety of different uh, technologies and a variety of different um, opportunities to take advantage of this. And we built this for the, for the community to be able to use. This is an observational study. We don't interfere with the um, um, decisions that are made between a veterinarian, the owner, and the dog. Uh, but we do collect information that can be used to answer any particular question of relevance. We began thinking about this um, in terms of what would it take in order to um, determine the true incidence of cancers, the uh, some of the four of the most common cancers, in golden retrievers. And by so doing, we came up with a number of 3,000 that would allow us to uh, be certain of reaching a, uh, an aggregate, ten point, uh, aggregate endpoint over a 10-year period of time. And by that uh, period of time, we'd be able to put some very tight uh, confidence intervals around the true incidence in a captive population, which has not been done before. We also wanted, though, to uh, make sure that we provided a um, diversity of uh, geographic um, experiences and exposures, as well as a combination of uh, dogs in different gender uh, status categories so that we could also begin to look at systematic evidence about what happens to uh, various disease outcomes as a function of reproductive hormone status. So our observational phase is, um, has was launched um, in about uh, 2000, 2012, and um, I'll go through some of, the, uh, some of the specifics of that, but we were able to enroll 3,000 dogs in about three years. And for um, the aggregate diagnosis, we will set a time point of um, 500 aggregate uh, uh, diagnoses in those four categories, lymphoma, osteomast cell tumor, high-grade mast cell tumor, and hemangiosarcoma. And once we reach that, we know that uh, the dogs will, know, will uh, still be alive, some of the dogs will be alive, and we will continue to monitor them. Again, these are the four primary cancers, and we chose these based on the nature of the impact that the cancer burden has in golden retrievers uh, from a uh, study that was produced uh, by the Golden Retriever Club of America back in 1998-99 and indicated that about 80% of dogs that succumb to cancer will die from these particular types of tumors and that um, about 50 to 60% of golden retrievers, purebred golden retrievers, will uh, die from cancer. But we also realized that we were uh, missing an opportunity if we didn't include secondary endpoints. And we took from that same study uh, a series of conditions and diseases that rose above a 4% uh, greater incidence or prevalence uh, for that population. So uh, hypothyroidism, uh, allergic diseases, heart failure, epilepsy, hip dysplasia, and renal failure were the ones that came out of that particular study as being uh, particularly uh, common or common enough. Uh, but we pay attention to any other condition that seems to be arising that might rise above that level and we'll continue to devote more resources to that should that happen. So uh, we, re we uh, hit our goal in 2015. And you can see uh, from the map on the uh, left-hand side of the slide that it's a 
it's a dispersed um, uh, enrollment pattern, although it is uh, clear that it also is associated with, uh, you know, human population density, as you would expect. And we have dogs that are enrolled in, in all of the 48 states of the United States with a distribution of predominant uh, suburban uh, environments, but um, uh, rural and some urban environments. So if you look at, you know, 10% of 3,000, we have 300 dogs that live in a classified urban environment that we can look at some of the specific uh, risk factors that might be unique for uh, other outcomes. We go through a, a very large um, uh, effort to collect uh, information on each one of these dogs, and it is a um, it's a fairly uh, sizable commitment from owners, veterinarians, and a uh, and a group of um, participants that help to manage the uh, the group, the cohort. Uh, so physical exams are done every year, or more, more frequently if needed. Uh, we also collect um, a whole series of biological samples that are submitted to a uh, a uh, formal biorepository organization. Uh, questionnaires about the lifestyle, diet, uh, behavior are uh, completed by owners and a physical examination, essentially a very short but important uh, electronic medical record um, questionnaire is made uh, each year by veterinarians that see these dogs. We also collect uh, tumor and normal tissue samples at the time that a dog does develop uh, cancer for purposes of looking at a variety of the uh, the basic um, types of biological, molecular, and genetic changes that might occur in in dogs with disease. So, just for um, uh, sort of gee whiz sort of factors here, we've got an example of the owner questionnaire. Each one of those little um, uh, colored areas is a separate page, although this is uh, web based and. Uh, for uh, any particular owner, they will be able to pretty much go through and have an, a variety of different uh, pages that they need to fill in, but as well, they will uh, skip a number of areas that are not relevant to that particular dog. So um, as um, owners are becoming more and more familiar with the study, uh, it takes less time for them to do this. At the beginning, it was um, necessary to help uh, support them through it because it is kind of a, uh, it's a, fairly significant amount of information, but you'll see that we, with the help of a number of um, individuals that are that were involved with um, task force development, that we were able to put together a very long list of things that could potentially have an impact on uh, outcomes, and including a, um, a behavior questionnaire that was developed by uh, James Serpell at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, this is the veterinary questionnaire that relates to physical exam findings, history, and a uh, dermal mass map that uh, is an automated uh, process where a veterinarian can keep track of dermal um, lesions or dermal masses uh, over time with both size and, uh, and diagnosis. So moving right into where we are now, uh, I'd like to uh, just sort of start by letting you know that as of um, June 15th, we had uh, about 100 dogs that have withdrawn. It should be 2,720. And about uh, 221 dogs that have deceased. And the withdrawals are uh, usual for a study like this, but in fact, our overall compliance rate is in the high 80s, 80%, uh, which is quite good. And withdrawals are um, very explainable. So you'll see that um, we currently have only 221 dogs that have died out of a cohort of 3,000. Um, and I'd like to um, just remind you that uh, if you do the math, that's really uh, only about, uh, that's less than 10% uh, of the dogs that have uh, been eliminated from the cohort for which there will not be any other uh, data points. So even though we're now six or seven or even eight years into the study, uh, we only have, um, 10% of the dogs that are, have been uh, exited from uh, data collection, not including the withdrawn dogs. So that's uh, there's a lot of data that will be flowing into this study over the next uh, six to eight years, uh, so much so that it can be overwhelming to think about. Uh, we are currently keeping track of um, the different types of cancers that are 
causing both um, that have been identified and those that have been associated with um, with deaths. Um, so of the 221 total deaths, um, that 82 are from other diseases, but this is about 60% of the dogs that have um, died of some sort of cancer, uh, lymphoma, high-grade mast cell tumors, hemangios, and other all other cancers. So that is very consistent with um, some of the other larger um, non prospective or non-longitudinal studies. But remember, this is a fairly, still a fairly young population of dogs. All of these dogs are um, in the middle ages, middle of their age, and a lot of the lymphomas that we saw actually occurred at a relatively young age. Uh, the frequency of diagnosis for hemangiosarcomas is picking up quite quickly. Uh, this is a, uh, a bar graph of uh, not only the four primary tumors, but of the other types of cancers that we've seen um, in some detail. We are uh, close to having a, enough histiocytic sarcomas to identify them as a uh, primary endpoint and may choose to do that as this develops. But, um, you know, high-grade soft tissue sarcomas and all these other tumor types are also um, relatively interesting to follow over time. Uh, in terms of the types of lymphomas that are um, being reported, uh, this pretty much uh, identifies the pattern that we would likely expect. Um, and there'll be some interesting news from Janet about how to uh, how we're going to uh, continue to uh, phenotype these uh, types of lymphomas. At the beginning, we had a, a challenge uh, identifying phenotypes for a variety of reasons. But um, things are moving along. We had predicted we'd see approximately uh, around 100, 120 dogs with lymphoma. So um, all of this is is estimated from data that um, only exists in one particular area, one particular type. So we are kind of uh, walking through and creating our creating this information as we speak. So um, I'd like to pass the uh, the pointer over to uh, Dr. Patterson Kane, and she can take it from here about some of the really incredible resources that are available. Thank you, Rod. Uh, so I'm going to go over what's happening this year. In August this year, we celebrated the eighth anniversary of this study, which is an amazing achievement for everybody involved. I'm going to go through the things listed here. Uh, I just wanted to say I'll talk about our current partners at the end, uh, but we are currently establishing some really exciting new partnerships uh, that will be announced before the end of the year. Uh, for those of you who are in the private sector and might be interested in becoming involved with the study, if you think you can add some scientific value, you are very welcome to email me. The address is at the bottom there, or contact me uh, via LinkedIn. We'd be very pleased to talk to you. So starting off with our initiative around lymphoma, those of you involved in the veterinary oncology field would be very aware that when a dog gets lymphoma, although it is optimal to have a tissue biopsy specimen taken, it's not absolutely necessary in many cases. So we found that we were not receiving samples from many of the lymphoma dogs that were going through the study vets. We therefore teamed up with Dr. Ann Avery of the uh, hematopathology lab at Colorado State University. Just to put a face to the name, that's Dr. Avery there. And holding the golden retriever is Julia Labadee, who is now the study epidemiologist uh, for the foundation, has come to join us. Uh, so now we uh, cover an aspirate being sent to Dr. Avery's lab. That gets typed and examined by flow cytometry. That means that uh, Anne can also isolate the DNA for us. Obviously, typing these as T or B cell lymphomas is very important for researchers who may wish to work with us. Uh, Dr. Avery's lab have actually phenotyped approximately 40,000 lymphoproliferative diseases from canine patients. So that's been very positive, and we've had basically 100% uptake since then. And I just wanted to talk about the biorepository. Obviously, if we're sampling 3,000 dogs or close to every year, we have a lot of samples. 
This is not a picture of our biorepository, uh, but just so you can visualise it in your mind, our samples probably fill about nine of these minus 80 freezers at this stage. So we have a lot of samples and we would like to use them. We had previously run two requests for proposals on an annual basis for, for academics to access the samples. We decided that wasn't sufficient, so that, that now runs year round. Uh, I've given the website address there for anyone who wants to inquire. We do have a tier system. So if you look on the right, uh, in tier one, for example, would be the most valuable sample would be a serum sample from a dog prior to its cancer diagnosis. And the least valuable sample would be hair or toenails from a dog without any of the diseases of interest. That said, any day a dog could move from tier four to tier one. Uh, so it's definitely a changing picture as we move through the study. Here are some of the studies. The first four occurred through those first annual requests for proposals with topics ranging from heart disease through obesity to training veterinary scientists to the gut microbiome. The study at the bottom, blood profiling for early detection of lymphoma, just came through our open call. So we're just starting that study now. The other resource we have is our data commons. So we have quite a bit of the phenotypic data available out there. This can include uh, medical diagnoses, behavior, uh, all sorts of demographics. This is currently available to academics and I've given the website by which you can inquire, we do ask for identification. With both the samples and the data, we're very happy to talk to private sector partners. So again, if you just contact us directly and we can talk about what you would like to do. Another very exciting thing uh, that has happened uh, late last year is that the V Foundation, with their strong interest in comparative oncology, humans versus dogs, uh, arranged a matching fund for us. So a generous donor gave a million. Uh, they matched it at one of their events with another million. And so currently we are genotyping all of the dogs. Uh, this is using a SNP chip array, and that data will ultimately be available for researchers to use. Obviously, this is huge value when it is associated with all of the phenotypic information that we have collected. Later on this year, we're going to start deep sequencing of the genomes from cancer dogs, both their normal tissue and the cancer tissues themselves. So we'll really be getting into some deep cancer science, looking at aspects such as mutation. I mentioned before that a dog could go from the lowest tier of value to the highest the, middle, the minute that dog is diagnosed with cancer. Uh, so we do wish to start looking at, at some of our data around the cancer dogs with the genotyping. So we decided to recruit some controls. Uh, so we initiated the Golden Oldies project where we asked people with golden retrievers over 12 years of age who obviously have not yet succumbed to cancer uh, to get us a blood sample for DNA extraction. We figure that a golden retriever that's made it to 12 has probably basically won the game in terms of cancer. And we wanted to get these studies started as soon as we could. We really had an overwhelming response. We were looking for about 200 and were worried we might only get half of that. But within a few weeks, we had almost 300 people uh, inquire uh, and become eligible to submit their samples. So we're right in the middle of that at the moment. Uh, it was a very touching to see how much people responded to the study and, and wanted to help us. And I just wanted to share some of the wonderful photos that they sent us. We do ask them for those when they send the sample, uh, particularly like the one on the top left of the dog with the snowy face running through the snow. Uh, the photograph on the top right, uh, Kelsey is uh, the mother of those puppies behind her. That litter are all in the Golden Retriever Lifetime study. So then she was able to join them with her Golden Oldie samples. And we were also surprised by how active some of these 12-year-old uh, and older Goldens actually are. Here, but here are a couple of them competing or running along the beach. So everyone enjoyed uh, seeing that as the samples came in. 
One thing I really wanted to emphasize is that as scientists, you know, we're thinking of this as data, data points, uh, you know, what publications can we get out of this and how can we advance the science? But a very, very big part of the study for us are the participants. And by participants, we mean not only the dog owners, but also the study veterinarians to whom these dogs go every year. You may have noticed with the photos of the dogs that we call them heroes. So they each have a hero number. And then we have our supporters, which are not only people who are interested in helping out with the study, but also any other pets that are in the homes where the heroes live. On Facebook, we have the 3,000 strong community. They run this themselves. Uh, you know, we make sure we get the right information to them. It's become a very strong community of people helping each other stay in the study and just helping each other personally. In fact, I was talking to one of the volunteers and she told me that this study is the most important thing she's ever done in her life, which I think is very touching that people are so committed to a study of this type. Obviously, we are losing dogs to cancer and other causes, and ultimately, we're going to lose them all. So we have very solid bereavement team support, and we make sure that we generate memorials for the heroes as we lose them from the study. One thing we did want to flag, and this has been arranged by uh, Dr. Page, is a workshop for the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine. This is very prestigious, uh, particularly to get canine science being recognised in this way. This will be in the role of companion animals as sentinels for predicting environmental exposure effects on both ageing and cancer susceptibility in humans. And we do gather quite a lot of information uh, about the environment of these dogs as we're going through the study. So we'll be supporting this workshop and we'll be attending it, which we are hoping will be sometime next year uh, if COVID-19 allows us to meet again. Just to finish off, I wanted to again lift up some of the people involved in the study. This is our study steering committee comprised of scientists from all sorts of fields, including genomics, uh, nutrition, behaviour, the microbiome. Uh, these people are helping us, uh, you know, get the most scientific value uh, out of this very long study indeed, and we appreciate them being involved. There's certainly been a lot of generosity from the scientific community. And I'd like to finish off really by uh, acknowledging our partners. The founding partners were the Morris family, uh, the Mark and Betty Morris Family Foundation, uh, and then other partners who have, have helped us both financially and scientifically, including the Petco Foundation, who have a great relationship with us, for which we are very grateful. Uh, Blue Buffalo, VCA, of course, the uh, V Foundation, Orvis, uh, just been a wonderful partner. And then our gold sponsors, including the um, Golden Retriever Foundation, we are, of course, very involved with uh, people who support the Golden Retriever breed, and the Hadley and Marion Stewart uh, Foundation, in addition to Zoetis, uh, and finally our golden champion, Mars Veterinary. We wouldn't get where we were today uh, without the people in the study, the scientific uh, community, and these partners who have helped make this happen. Thank you for your attention.